Hello. So this is going to be a video on Houdini lighting, look dev and rendering for my users. This is a very quick overview. I'm just trying to throw out all the information that I wish I knew when I first had to use Houdini. I'm primarily a my user, but there are numerous jobs over the years where I've had to use Houdini for lighting and rendering. So I set up this quick example scene. Um, I'll quickly cover everything that I think is necessary. There is much more to it. Houdini is a bit more complicated, but I'll just cover the things I think are necessary. Timestamps will be in the descriptions below, so feel free to just jump and use that because I don't know how long this video will be. And yeah, let's let's jump right in. So in this scene, so far, um, so when you open up Houdini, the controls will be similar to Maya. So when you hold down Alt and left left click, then you can rotate around the focal point, and Alt hold down right click and you can zoom in and out and then alt with middle mouse uh, shifts around and spacebar and f that focuses on whatever is selected so nothing is selected so it was doing that to the center of the origin spacebar and h that resets actually on the bottom of the screen you can probably see it says home home c plane so that's basically resetting. So if you have any camera clipping plane weirdness going on, maybe press Control H with your scene, or you could press D and go to view, and then you can actually change your near and far clipping planes. This is something that, you know, is more well known in Maya, how to fix where it is. Okay, so on the yeah, on the top menus, you've got all the different things. It is very much like Maya, but you don't, you know, so you could just click around there and search for things. Otherwise, on the right hand side, you've got your main menu, which is the object menu. So you can, with all these menus, you can hit tab and you can search to create something. So in the object menu, this is where you would put a camera. You know, so if you're doing a VFX project, this is where you would create a camera or import an Alembic camera. So in fact, you would probably search for Alembic. So I hit tab and just search for Alembic something like that. If you want to create primitive objects, you know, you can search for a sphere or a cube. Let's just do the sphere for the moment. And then I hit enter, select, and what it does is it creates a geometry node. And then you double click on that. And this is where the actual sphere is. I cannot see the sphere. So I've just selected this and I'll press space bar and F and it finds the sphere for me. On the right hand side, we have these different options. So you've got light, uh, normal lighting or shaded textures on. Um, that's pretty much all you need. Um, if you wanna go to your render camera, let's say you've got a render camera. Actually, let's create another camera. So I've gone back, I went back and menu there. So object is pretty much the main menu. I'm gonna hit tab, search for camera. Whoops. Um, Okay, so we've got camera one. So let's say I want to render something or I want to move my camera in a more dynamic way. So what I can do is here, I can select camera and I can press this lock. And what this means is now if I move around in this view, it's actually moving the location of this camera. So I'm holding Alt and holding down right click at the same time. And now middle click just to shift around and then I can unlock. So now when I zoom out, you'll notice it says no cam. Because I've unlocked it, now the camera is there. So I've not affected it. The good thing about that is it means when you go back to your camera, if you, um, you know, by accident um, moved, it doesn't actually affect your camera position. So that's, that's a pretty neat thing that it does as well so with objects with the object menu in houdini what happens is whenever you import an object or geometry you get a geometry node and here is where you can make adjustments so let's say this sphere by the way is pretty much a nerbs object so if we want to put any textures onto it we would have to convert it into polygons so i hit tab and search for convert so let's say that's what we want to do. And you'll notice this is blue. 
and then purple the purple means it's going to render that and the blue is the visible so let's let's shift that down and you can see after the conversion we now have a pretty harsh looking sphere so then we can actually change the amount of divisions let's just put 20 20 it's pretty smooth pretty smooth okay that's great and another alteration generic one you could do is transform so i hit tab search transform and then connect that up and let's view we want to see it and i hit um go to the cursor bit oh if you select a node in the object area and nothing's happening move your mouse to the scene view and hit enter and then it will actually give you the parameters of what that node is related to if that makes sense so transform i nothing happened but when i hit enter it actually gave me the ability to now transform my sphere okay so i can go to my camera view so cam cam one and i can actually change you know some of the stuff to do with my sphere so i've got the hotkeys e uh, sorry w w is for shaded and wireframe e scale r rotate and t is move so i could actually just scale this up a bit for our camera and there we go in some companies they add a null at the end you can also use nulls for scaling as well maybe not in this menu but in the uh, in the main object one so outside of the geometry area it's not uncommon to see um, because of the scale differences if you're modeling stuff in Maya you might have to change the uniform scale to something like 0. Um, I think it's 0. 0.1 I forgot the spot the scale differences are but for example if you're importing a lot of assets from Maya and the scaling is um, you know uh, 10 times bigger then you can essentially just do this on a null and then start connecting up all your object to that one null and easily scale everything as well cool also uh, something that is very typical is when when you're creating objects to be rendered at least in VFX projects you would name it and then put render after it so for example this is I'm going to call this ball underscore render and that's just to remind you that you, in the render area you need to put in this object to render okay so we've got a camera and we've got an uh, object so we need to create a render node or a ROP basically so I go to the out area so we've got the, the main ones that you'll need to pay attention to everything else you can pretty much ignore to be honest object this is where you make objects and cameras out that's where you do your rendering and mats that's where you do your materials however it's not always where you do your materials so just to add a bit of confusion because this is a general area where you do materials but but what you can do is have self-contained materials which is great because let's say you've got a complicated scene you've got this this stuff going on and you've just been focusing on one asset and your friend says or colleague whatever they say oh yeah can you just sort out this ball render what you can do is you can actually self-contain the shader by going in here typing in mat sorry material and create a material network and then I double clicked on that so now I could put a shader in here and it will be contained within this ball render node which is pretty cool I've just realized we don't have a material so I should just say if you hit tab search material there we go you can actually just apply a material here there is no group because this is just a single object polygon that we converted to a polygon so we can just put a shader in there as an example in the matnet I'm going to hit tab let's uh, search for principles so I'm using by default uh, Houdini uses mantra 
So principal shader is mantra. So let's just make this color red. Here we go, and I can call it ball underscore ps for principal shader. Keep in mind these are multipliers. So this the base color here, they were all 0 0.2 to start with. So if you are importing a base color texture, you want to put them all to one. So it's pure white because this is a multiplier. And the same goes for roughness as well. Because if you are putting in a roughness map, then this is actually reducing it. It's already having an impact, which I, f I personally think is quite stupid. So I don't, I don't know why it's set up like that. Um, what else? You know, if you want to import textures, you do it in the textures tab. Keep in mind that Mantra, if you're using it, primarily works with .rat files. So if you create textures in Substance, let's say Substance Painter, and you export them as TIFFs, then it's I. Um, it's a good idea to convert them to rats. So you can get scripts online to do that. But if you do that in Houdini, you would have to go to render, mplay, load disk files, and then wait. For some reason, it takes a while to load. And then find your textures. So there we go. There's one texture. And then you would have to go file, save frame as, and then name it, and then at the end put dot rat. So for example, I I dot rat, and then I hit enter, and you see it changed some of this stuff, and then you click save. I'm not going to click save because I don't want to overwrite anything. And there we go. That is one rat file. The thing is, because Houdini is going to convert it to a rat when you try render anyway, similarly to Arnold converting to TX files. I don't think rats are MIP maps like Arnold. You know, MIP map is an image format which has different iterations of the resolution. So it's like versioning. Um, but anyway, you know, if, if Mantra is going to convert them anyway, when you've got a lot of textures, you want to remove any conversion time, basically. So it's a way of optimizing. Anyway, it's up to you to do that. So if you want to load in textures, you would do it here. You turn on use texture and yeah, just remember what I was saying there. So if you are putting in textures, put the roughness to one. So it's reading that full roughness and then put your base color, all that stuff to one as well. With metallic, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter if it depends if your object is metallic or not. If you are putting in a metallic map, metalness map, I should say, and you want to put it to one. So bump and normals as well. This just put your normal map in here. Don't put a bump in. So you click enable. Just put in your normal map there as a dot rat as well. For displacement, um, you could put in your height map from substance, or if you actually have painted in Mari a displacement map, then you would put it in here and load it in there. And something to be aware of is what you could do as well, if you want it to be a bump map, you could load it in there, change this offset to zero, and then turn off true displacements, and you will have a bump map. So there we go. And that is all self-contained within this object, because you can see these different levels. So what we started with, we created the ball node, Sorry, we created the sphere, which created this geometry node. And then we started to do things in here. So we converted its polygons, we transformed it for the camera, and then we created a material, and then we can apply. So in this material, um, yeah, I click here, here, and we can find the object. And because we've created this matte net, we can actually find the shader, it's all self self-contained so if anyone needed this in their shot or in their project then it's very easy to you know pass it on as well rather than just everything being in the mat area as well so we've accepted that and now that's been applied cool and 
what else? Oh yeah, with within the shaders. So you saw how I imported everything. Initially, when when I did stuff in Houdini, I would do it the Maya way, which is create a texture as an example. And if you're doing look dev, you know you might add in color correct, and then you go oh, okay. So I want the color to go to there, and then I do a color correct, lift that up, and then the color back out you know you might you know will that work yes but is it um are there any cons to it yeah it can be a bit more buggy and slow things down in the long run it's better to just do these sort of changes internally within you know within the shader it depends on the size and scale of your project so typically I was told I was always told to do it within the shader. I have tested it both ways and I got the same sort of result. But you know, if people that use Houdini every day for decades, if they're telling me to use it within the principal shader, then obviously I will do that. Um when you hit tab, there are other things that you can use. So standard um thing that I use a lot is clamp. So you see that we've got a roughness input somewhere. So yeah, just making you aware that some of the same stuff you have in Maya will be within Houdini. So let's try jump in here. But when you do that, because the node is not unlocked, you'll get this message coming up, basically. So what we need to do is unlock the shader to, in order to get inside it. So we right click and we do allow editing of contents. I'm just going to disconnect this bit here. So what I can do is hold down Y and you get scissor symbol and you can actually draw a line. And then when you release, it'll cut any connections. So that's pretty cool. So now that we've unlocked the shader, when we go inside, you see there's a lot, there's a lot of craziness. To make this area bigger, I can hold down control and press B. Basically, this is just all the inputs. So I don't need to know 100% what's going on. I just need to find, okay, the base color. So, you know, imported the texture. This, you would do, um, in my experience, you would only really go into this if you're just doing some form of look deving. So for safety, I would make a null. So I hit tab, search null. And the idea is just, we can see all these connections going into the color. And we don't want to destroy that. We just want to um, neatly put them into this one line. Otherwise, you know, you could you could end up breaking a shader. And then you could put in your color corrects or your color mix. Color mix, very cool node. Because what you could do with a color mix is, uh, before I plug it in, you can see you've got bias amount and secondary color. So what this means is, what you could do is you could drop in a color mix. And if you want a different um, like texture being blended, then you can actually plug in in the bias. That's where you can put in your transparency map for the second texture. And then in secondary, you could get a different picture. So as an example, um, dirt, like you could create a procedural pattern and you can put it into the bias as a cutaway and then secondary color. So you could just pick a constant if you need a secondary color. Actually, maybe not constant. Um, actually, you could, you could pick colors with inside there. Okay, so second color for now is a purple. I don't know why. Let's say dark red. So that would be a secondary color. And then in the bias mount, so if I rendered this now, it would be 50% dark red versus 50%. Um, actually, they're both red. <laughs> I think in the in the actual shader, didn't I make the color red? I did. Yep. Okay. There we go. Anyway, that's just an example. So let's jump back in. And if you change your mind about any of these nodes, but you're not sure about deleting them, you can select them, and then you could go to this area, which is bypass. So it doesn't delete them, but it just it just bypasses them. So simple enough. Okay, let's 
Let's make it smaller, holding control and tap B. Now it's smaller. Okay, so creating lights, let's quickly cover that. You could see I've got this camera clipping problem, so I'm gonna press spacebar and H, and now it's reset, so it's solved that issue. Okay, let's look at this goblin character. How did I import this? So the way in which I created this, this goblin setup was I got the Alembic, I exported an Alembic from Maya. So I renamed everything in a nice way. And when you import an Alembic in that manner, in order to get the groups and naming from Maya, you need to go to primitive groups and change it to name group using transform node full path. Remember when you export an Alembic to turn on in the settings, write UVs and world space if you've put it in a particular load um, location. You need to do that as well. And then with inside there, when you click, um, when you load an Alembic, so I'm, I'm pressing this visibility just to display it. You could press I, this is where you get information about what is coming in. So we see all these different groups. It's saying we've got 15 primitives in there, which is cool. So it means it's loaded correctly. And you can see what I've named all these different areas. And that's also important because we can use things called wild, wild cards, which basically just, for example, the word eyeball, if we want to select just the eyeballs, we can just type that phrase, put an asterisk at either end, and then it will just select those. So a good way in which to separate these and control them a bit more is to use group create. So hit tab, search group create. And then you would plug that in. And then within there, what you can do is you can click on this base group and it will come down with the geometry. So what you could do is just pick one, one thing. But that's created a very specific path which is good and bad because if you change the model in Maya and rename it, it won't necessarily pick up the same model. So that's kind of good and bad. But what you could do is, as I said earlier, you can press asterisk and search the word eyeball and hit asterisk again, hit enter. That is a wild card. So now when I view here, you can see the eyeballs are highlighted. And when I go to display group and attribute list, you see the uh, highlighted yellow there as well. So that's worked. And it means if we go, if someone goes back to Maya and they change it and the name of it changes from, what was it called? Eyeball underscore geo one. Let's say it changes by accident to eyeball underscore geo three. If, because we've got this, a wild card then that won't matter it will still pick it up so when we reload when we select the alembic and then reload from whoever's altering the model it'll still be fine we could also use a blast node a blast node can be uh, destructive and I'll explain why um, actually the, I was just about to show you the way which is not destructive Okay, let's, okay, as an example, I've got my Alembic selected. So I'll select the head and then hit delete and you'll see it creates a blast. So it's deleted the head and it just says 14. So it's picked that uh, group of vertices and it's just uh, removed them. And the thing is when the model, if it gets updated at any point or changes, then this blast node can be defunct, so it'll stop working. So if you start doing stuff like that or separating things, because you can, you can also use this blast node, although I hit delete, I could also do the invert, uh, inverted version of that. So I could, I could use it to isolate that selection. So if I wanted to apply a shader just to that head, what I could do is I could blast it out and then type material and then I could plug that in and then I could do copy and paste that and then invert it and then um, merge the results, hit merge. So I could, you know, blast the head out and then blast the eyes and everything else out and then put 
a material on one, material on the other, and then merge together. Seems logical, but because I've just done it in such a destructive way, it's yeah, it's gonna become unstuck. You never know when you might change a model. So the group method I think is, is good. You can also use groups within a blast. So I'm just making you aware of that when you delete something as well. So the way in which I've done it for this particular um, setup is I've done the group create and then I put in the wild cards. I also changed, you change these as well, just to something that you can pick up later down the line. So I did it for all the separate parts of this character. So for the rings, I'm just going to select them just so you can see the wild cards I'm using. But as you can see as well, it's you can see what it's picking up. So I just did a wild card here and it picks up all these different things. Like that is so convenient. It's very cool. So the material node, then what you do is you can use the groups to apply specific shaders. So you can create, I'll create another one there. So I press the plus or you can delete doing that. So you click on the group. So all these are the ones that are from Maya, the Maya groups coming straight from the Alembics. And these ones here are the ones that I just created upstream. So just above everything else. So then I can pick, I just want the I pupil underscore group, and then you can pick your shader. And because it's self-contained within this goblin underscore render node, I can just pick, oh, I want, you know, the pupils to be gold. So there we go. So when I render that, they will be gold. But I don't want that. Actually, that sounds terrible. Okay. So I've done this and then I applied, I did this for each of them. Let's jump inside the shader. So what I've done is I've made these different shaders. In fact, gold, the gold one is just a default one. So if you want to use if you want to use the default shaders within Houdini, but you want it to be within your self-contained object, what you could do is go to the material palette and you can see down here, we've actually got this object goblin render, goblin matte net. So we can scroll down. Let's say we want rough glass so we can actually put it into our self-contained object. And then when we go back to the matte net, you can see it's just appeared here. So now we have, we have rough glass self-contained within our object. So it's more, you know, a sort of organizational type of thing. <clears throat> okay, so in terms of the look devving and stuff like that, so with each of these objects, you go inside the shader and you can see I was actually, there's quite a lot of stuff you can, you could play around with. But here's an example. I'm actually bypassing it. But I believe what I was talking about earlier with primary and secondary colors, I was doing a test with the base color. So what I had was the original texture going in as a primary color and then the bias was so basically the the map that i wanted to select what was appearing and what was not i was using a curvature mixed with noise so i was picking um so the dark areas the shadowing areas of the object basically um uh, what's, I'm trying to think of a good way to explain this. Basically, the crevices and creases and wrinkles of the character, I basically wanted to exacerbate the color, so make it darker, and then make it lighter. So if I go to this color correct here, so I've got the diffuse um, or base color, and then you can see I turned the value up there in the color correct, and then that's plugged into secondary. So what was happening here in my test was I was making the higher points on the character, like the ridge of the nose and, um, you know, just nowhere inside wrinkles. I wanted to make them brighter to exaggerate the look, but you could also see I bypassed this. So it means I got to a point where I thought, actually, this is rubbish, but it just shows you what you, what you can do. You know, that's using a curvature that I'm using turbulent 
noise and then also a rest position because otherwise, otherwise these will move. I believe they're 3D, 3D noises or something like that. It's not quite the same as using um, using a noise within my sort of different different game we're playing. Okay, so that's how I connected everything up there. I'm going to press Control B and let's go to the object area. So I've got got the render camera in there. This is where you can set up your resolution. Icon scale, that's just the size of the camera in the viewport. So I'm pressing spacebar F to zoom onto this. Um, so yeah, we could pick the resolution, the focal length. If you want a background image appearing, so if you've got footage, if you're doing a VFX shot and you've got footage, you might want to load a background image just to, you know, if you're trying to line something up or if you've got some reference. Um, that's pretty much it for the, for the render camera. In terms of lights, let's uh, let's make a new one. So I've got, I do have all these lights here and these are actually all constrained to this null. Like I love constraining lights because I just find it super useful really. Okay, so the only things you really need are, you just need an environment light. So this will be your HDR. And to find these, if you hit tab, search light. So a light is just the generic one and you can change the settings inside. So if you want an area light, a spotlight, that sort of thing, you could change it within that standard light. And then the environment light, that is what will be your HDR or image based light. So when you create an environment light, you will get something like this. So you can see I've put in some HDR that I got off, off the internet. And then I lowered the exposure and that was pretty much it. And then for this rim light, which you can see here, intensity by default is one and then exposure is 11. And I changed the type. I think by default, the type is point. So I changed it to grid. So if you want to see the light, you want to turn on render light geometry and then change the area size as well. Um, there are a few other general options. I mean, if you've used my before, it's self-explanatory. Some of these options will only affect the type of light you pick as well. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, but aside from that, one thing that um, might be of use is actually the shadow mask. So if you don't want an object to be affected by a light, then you can see in the shadow mask, this affects all of your lights as well. And there's an asterisk there, so that selects everything. So this light is affecting all the objects. So if we want it to not, <clears throat> to not affect one object, so let's say the eyes, eyeballs, for some reason, then we could actually click there. Oh, actually, no, it's uh, it's object based. Okay, so let's say we don't want the ball to be affected by that light or cast shadows because of that light. We would select that ball, and when we click accept shadow pattern, it means this light is going to affect all these objects there. So it's kind of like light linking, pretty much, but what I want is to just reset that. So I'll just put the asterisk back there. So you've got that same option with all these lights as well. If you want to constrain a light, because if I select one of these and press uh, T um, and then move it, you'll notice it starts to bend. If you would like to do that with a light, search tab, I'll make a fresh one. And I'll change from type to grid. So this is an area light. Um, sampling quality. Um, actually, it says in the description there that it's for area lights and sunlight. So keep that in mind. So I primarily use just uh, area lights. It means you can just improve samples per, um, per light rather than, you know, put up all your 
multiply samples, you know. So let's put this on 100 by 100 just so we can see it. Okay, so it's there. And what we could do is to create the constraint, we can go to constraint, makes sense. And you can see this funny little picture of some eyes and you click on look at and you see at the bottom of the screen we have a prompt that says now select uh, at oh, I can't read now select look at object if any press enter to accept selection so I'm not going to select anything I'm going to hit enter hit enter again and you'll see it's just loaded up something there we can see there's a no and there's a look at and get world space so if I just jump back and we will see there is now a new null, null three. So to avoid confusion, I should probably rename these, but I'm just going to prove a point for a second. You see it as I move this null, the light now faces that particular direction. So then you could name this um, fill O2 probably add light at the end and then you could call this fill underscore o2 constraint something like that it's pretty much what I did with the character and then I just put this thingamajig this null inside and then I moved the light around I did that for all, all three of them as well so yeah that's a pretty useful little thing so I'm, I'm going to delete those because I don't actually want that. So let's jump to the render settings. So where you actually do the rendering and setups. So you go to the out section and you create a thing called a ROP, which is the shape, um, sorry, the render, the render node, basically. So if you want to create one, you type in hit tab, type mantra. There you go. You have one. But because I've already got one, I'm just going to talk about it briefly. So within here, you would select your camera and the resolution is inherited from your camera. If you remember when I clicked on the camera earlier, it had the resolution, which was half HD inside your render. Um, sorry, inside your ROP. This is where you can do for test renders. You can override the resolution. You can turn on your motion blurring. Um, by default, it's probably on the image tab. So you want to pick your output location within Houdini $F4 is frame range as well. So it's kind of like in Nuke where you've got percentage D that is image sequence and four hashes as well. That could be used uh, to signify an image sequence as well. So what else? So we have the default these like AOVs, like render passes, the default ones in this extra image planes tab. So you can see I've turned on a few. Personal favorite is combined lighting per component. So that's gonna separate the lights out. That's why I was talking about um, sampling, light sampling, because I like to separate the lights and then see which one, if there's one causing particular issues, then at least I can turn up the samples with one. Um, surface spec, spec rough, sorry, surface specular roughness. That will basically show you your roughness map. And you can see here, I actually added an extra image plane, which was for the light separations as well. Cause these def these are the default ones there as well. But sometimes I think, um, at least for the combined lighting per component, it was not working earlier. So I pressed plus. So it adds an image plane, which is a render pass. And then you click here and then you've got this list down here. So then I found it, combine lighting per light. And you can see there, but I'm going to delete that because I don't, I don't need that. I've already got it. Um, what else? You've got extra settings, crypto mat. If you're familiar with Maya, you would be aware of what is going on there. And then for rendering, you've got pixel samples. This is basically the, the AA samples in Maya for Arnold. Um, so this is all the uh, overall multiplier, I should say. 
And then you've got min, min and max ray sample. So this is kind of like adaptive sampling. So it's saying this is the maximum multiplier for the rays. Noise level, this is like threshold within Arnold. I think it's called threshold um, or yeah, pretty sure that's right. But anyway, the lower this goes, this number, the more variation or um, the clearer basically the noise will be but you have to marry up between these two areas like the amount of samples you use because you could you could put this pixel samples to 10 by 10 which is a lot but then this could also be on 0.8 so nearly one so your render would probably still look pretty trash because there's not enough variation like these um, it's just giving the computer more time to look at the different um, like how two pixels relate to each other basically and then you have the general overrides for subsurface quality you know all this stuff is pretty self-explanatory if you've used it before render limits as well um, the main one that might be relevant to your scenes, probably the refract limit. Sometimes if you've got a lot of refraction occurring, you might end up just rendering black instead of see-through. That's because the ray limit has reached its max um, distance. So you might have to increase that. That's something that happened in Maya. And what else? Tile size. Uh, I normally reduce that when I use Maya or Houdini. Just because when you when you go to render view to render so you'll notice these little tiles pop up and that's just saying that's just the size at uh, the area size that the that your computer will look at so you have to you have to find a sort of um, what's this phrase like a good a good point basically because if they're too big then your computer, like if, if I made this number bigger and my computer might take hours just to render this big chunk. Whereas if I break it into smaller pieces, then it would give, um, it could just optimize the render speed pretty much. Saying that if you put the tile size to one, then you're pretty much where you started. Like it won't particularly help. Okay. So I think we've covered everything. The render settings, the objects, so now you can make an object, put it into a scene. So we've got the goblin, we imported an alembic from Maya, and then we created groups, separated the groups. Um, whoops. So yeah, we imported the alembic and separated the groups. Remember to use this display group and attribute list. So this is quite a clean way. We use wildcards to do that. We made a material network, created shaders inside there, did some look deving inside um, one of them at least, the goblin shader. So we did that and using a material node, we selected groups and then assigned shaders to specific groups. And then we looked at lights as well. So we talked about that and then we also covered how to make a constraint for a light and then we ended with setting up this uh, this ROP as well selecting the render camera and this is what the end render looks like so I've let it render for a few minutes now but I don't need to sit finish it's not an amazing render to be honest but let's just look quickly look at the passes that have come out so you can see it's pretty much like my you can use this drop down there is also another another menu here where you can change um the exposure and stuff like that and then reset it and then look at the alpha rgb you know that sort of thing so let's look at all subsurface so you can see <clears throat> subsurface uh, pass on its own subsurface color so this is when the rays hit and um, what 
uh, the color that's bouncing around basically when the rays penetrate and then the specular roughness I think there was a bit of color correction for that and then the separated lights that's pretty cool actually so you can see the subsurface scattering by the way clicking down on a certain point that makes the computer render that particular area I can't remember if my does that I haven't used my for a while now and then the top light that looks pretty freaky actually and the fill light not so freaky HDR pretty flat but then all combined there we go but by separating the lights at least we know okay we could turn up the samples in one because they're all apart from the HDR they are all area lights anyway anyway I hope that has been use um, useful to anyone like any my users pretty much I thought I would just summarize everything that I found useful when trying to use Houdini for lighting and rendering because you don't need to know that much to, to be honest because it's the same sort of stuff you would get in Maya but it, there is a bit of a learning curve as well so I thought I would, I would put that into one video and hopefully it was of use if it was um, feel free to you know subscribe and all that and consider signing up to the Patreon if you need extra help you can always send an email uh, if you sign up to the Patreon there is also content related to the other videos any scene files for some of the videos i create i put for my patrons as well anyway i hope that was of use cheers